Hello and welcome to Basics for Gamers presents The Basics of D&D Combat Part 1, The Combat Round and Movement. In this video we will discuss rounds, turns, initiative, surprise, and readied actions, along with the first part of what a player can do when it is their turn, movement, with Part 2 of this series set to continue that discussion with actions, reactions, and bonus actions. Combat in D&D flows much the same way as it does in other RPGs, especially other D20 based games. Combat is broken up into rounds, which are further broken up by turns. Each player gets one turn where they declare what they want their character to do. Once every player has declared their turn, and the DM has done the same for the NPCs under their control, then that is the end of the current round and the process continues with a new round. Incidentally, one round lasts 6 seconds in the game world, regardless of how many players and NPCs have a turn during it. One round is 6 seconds, and therefore one minute in the game world is 10 rounds at your table. It's easy to think of this as a standard board game where everyone takes a turn and play continues around the table. One full lap around the table is one round in the game. However, things in D&D get a little bit trickier due to initiative. Initiative organizes the chaos of combat and dictates the order in which participants declare their actions. So rather than turns being passed clockwise around the table as with common board games, players will bounce around the table to declare their actions when their spot in the initiative order comes up. When combat begins, all characters, both players and their opponents, make a dexterity check to determine their place in the initiative order. A standard initiative check is 1d20 plus the character's dexterity modifier. Players do this individually, but the DM rolls once per enemy group. Therefore, a gang of bandits will all have the same initiative score and act together instead of being divided up in the initiative order like the players. Once all characters have their initiative score, they are then ranked from highest initiative to lowest, and this determines the order in which characters act during the combat rounds, including future rounds, as initiative is only rolled once at the start of combat, not the start of every single round. The higher the total, the faster on the draw the character is. In case of a tie, the DM breaks the tie for enemies, and players decide how to break the ties between fellow players. In cases where a player and an enemy are tied, the DM makes the call as to who goes first. Although it is not a rule in 5th edition, some groups find it easiest to defer to the player with the highest dexterity score going first in the case of ties. When it comes around to your turn in the initiative order, you may move a distance equal to your speed score, take one action and one bonus action. Once you have done all three, your turn ends and play continues with the next creature in the initiative order. And note that you don't have to do all three of those items, but if you wish to do so, it must be declared during your turn. Since we're discussing initiative and the combat round, it's important to know that although a player cannot change their place in the initiative order, they can declare that they wish to act later in the round during another creature's turn. This is known as taking a readied action. At the start of a player's turn, if they don't know what it is they want to do, or if conditions are such that it doesn't make sense to act right then during their turn, then they can choose to ready their action and use it later that round. You spend your action on your turn when you declare that you are readying, and must spend your reaction that round to react and perform the action you readied. To do this, you announce a single action you wish to take and state a conditional trigger for that action. Essentially, you are saying, if X happens, then Y. Your action is being held until later, but you may still take your movement and bonus action immediately on your turn if you wish. You may not use your movement or bonus action later when the trigger occurs. But you can ready a dash action if what you want to do is move after the triggering condition. If the trigger occurs before the end of the round, you may choose to immediately respond with the action that you readied, 
or you can choose to do nothing, in which case the action that you invested is lost. For example, if your readied action is, I'm going to dive behind the wall if the orc aims his crossbow at me. You spend your action during your turn in the initiative order. If the orc never aims his crossbow at you, then the trigger never occurs and you don't react. But if the orc does aim his crossbow at you before the end of that round, then you may spend your reaction to immediately dive behind the wall and gain a cover bonus against the orc's attack. Note that you must spend your reaction after the triggering event in order to perform the action that you readied. What this means is you can't perform both a readied action and an opportunity attack in the same round as each of them require the use of your only reaction that round. If you ready an action on your turn and the enemy provokes an opportunity attack before your readied action is triggered, you can choose to take the opportunity attack, but in doing so, you stop readying your action and you can't react with it later if the triggering condition is met. For example, Quinn and Dela are playing baseball. Dela is behind home plate wielding a bat, and Quinn is on the pitcher's mound. Dela is first in the initiative with a score of 15, and Quinn is second with a score of 11. It's Dela's turn. She thinks Quinn is going to throw the ball at her, and she wants to hit it with her bat. But she can't take her action right now, because here on her turn, there's no ball within range of her to strike. So she decides to take a readied action. She announces that if a ball comes within reach of her bat, she will strike it. This costs her her action that turn even if the trigger is not met. But she can still take her movement and bonus action now if she wishes. She decides not to move from the plate and instead stares Quinn down. On Quinn's turn, he throws the ball at Dela, which then triggers her readied action and allows Dela to spend her reaction to swing her bat and knock it into the stance. She was able to act even though it is technically Quinn's turn in the initiative. And if Quinn had decided not to throw the ball at Dela, the triggering condition would not have been met and Dela would effectively have lost her action for that round. The readied action and trigger cease at the end of the current round and do not persist into the start of the next round. Other times you might want to take a ready action might include preparing yourself in case an enemy approaches. You might say, I'm readying an action. If an orc comes through that door, I stab it. Or you could say, I move over to the lever and ready my action. If a bandit steps on the trap door, I pull the lever. Or you can ready a dash action to move your speed. You could say, I move to the base of the cliff. If any kobolds cross the bridge, I start climbing. Remember, you cannot ready a bonus action, but you can ready a dash action if you wish to move after the trigger. Once the initiative order is in place, the DM must determine if anyone at the start of combat is taken by surprise. This is usually the result of one side hiding with dexterity stealth scores that are higher than the other side's passive perception scores. In a case like that, anyone not aware that they are in danger at the start of combat is taken by surprise. If any of your enemies fail to take you by surprise, then you are not surprised. Characters are only taken by surprise when they are unaware of all of their enemies. They don't realize they're in danger. And note that this is decided on an individual basis, so you may be taken by surprise even if other members of your party are not. When taken by surprise, combat proceeds as normal in the initiative order, but any character who is surprised is skipped over. They may not move or take actions during the first round, but may take a reaction, for example an opportunity attack, but only after their spot in initiative has passed in the first round. This only applies to the very start of combat, 
If creatures wish to hide and attack while being unseen later in the battle, it doesn't cause anyone to be skipped over on their turn. Instead, they function as unseen enemies, which is discussed in great detail in our Basics of Stealth video. During your turn, you can move a total number of feet equal to your speed score, and this can be broken up with other actions. For example, if your speed score is 30 feet, you can move 10 feet, take your action, and then move another 20 feet if you wish. And movement can also occur between segments of an action. So, for example, a fighter who attacks twice per action, they can move, attack, move again, and then attack again, and still move yet again after that as long as their total movement that turn does not exceed their speed. If you have multiple speed scores, for example, both a walking speed of 30 and a flying speed of 60, you can freely switch between those modes in the middle of your movement, but must subtract all previously spent movement from your new mode. For example, a wizard benefiting from a fly spell could fly 20 feet over a pit, then walk 10 feet, and no more since 20 flying and 10 walking meet that walking speed score of 30, but could lift off again and fly because they still have 30 feet remaining that they can fly. Their flying speed of 60 minus 20 for the first flight minus 10 for walking 10 feet. Your movement can also be impaired by difficult terrain. Any environment that is more difficult to walk through than a clear, even floor is likely to be declared difficult terrain. Examples include walking in sand, over rubble, up or down stairs, through shallow water, and basically any environmental condition that might slow you. Every foot of movement over difficult terrain costs an extra foot of movement against your speed score. So with a speed of 30 feet, you can only walk 15 feet of difficult terrain. Also note that walking through a space occupied by another creature, including your ally, is considered difficult terrain. And keep in mind that different sources of difficult terrain do not stack, so you wouldn't have to spend 3 feet of movement to climb uneven stairs that are made from the roots of a tree it would still be just two feet of movement per foot moved. Another activity that would consume some of your movement is standing up. Whenever you attempt to stand up, doing so consumes an amount of feet equal to half your speed score. So a character with a speed score of 30 who wishes to stand up from a prone position must spend 15 feet of movement to do so, but may still walk 15 feet after standing. Crawling while prone costs an extra foot of movement per foot moved, just like difficult terrain. However, since this isn't a form of difficult terrain, crawling penalties do stack with the penalties of difficult terrain. For example, crawling through sand would cost a total of three feet of movement for every foot that you crawl. You are allowed to move through the space of non-hostile creatures, treating their spaces as difficult terrain when you do so, but may only move through the space of a hostile larger creature if you are at least two size categories larger or two size categories smaller than that enemy creature. A medium sized creature could walk through the same space as a size tiny pixie or a size huge hill giant, and possibly provoke an opportunity attack while doing so but could not walk through the space of a small size kobold or a size large minotaur. A size small halfling, on the other hand, could move through the space of that minotaur because it is size small, which is two size categories smaller than the size large minotaur. Keep in mind, while you can move through the space of another creature, you cannot end your turn in another creature's space. Characters also suffer movement penalties when squeezing through a small space. 
Squeezing penalties are imposed when you try to move through a space that is one size category smaller than you. For example, your party discovers a secret door in a wall that opens into a small, narrow tunnel. If the DM decides that this is a small size opening, then the party's halfling can walk through it without a problem. But the medium sized humans and elves in the group are going to have to squeeze in order to pass through it. While squeezing, Characters spend one extra foot of movement for every foot squeezed through, very similar to difficult terrain. They also suffer disadvantage on attack rolls and on dexterity savings throws, and enemies attacking a squeezing target gain advantage to their attack rolls. You can also interact with objects and your environment while taking your movement. The DM decides if an interaction should cost any feet of movement on your turn but in general, most simple interactions should be allowed without a penalty. A few examples include drawing or sheathing a weapon, opening a door, fetching an item from your backpack, picking an item up off the ground, or handing something to another creature. In this video, we examined the combat round and movement. Combat in D&D is divided into rounds and turns. On each player's turn, they may move their character and declare an action, and a round is complete after every character in the encounter has taken their turn. One round may last several minutes in the real world, but is only 6 seconds in the game's narrative. The order in which characters take their turns each round is determined by the initiative order. At the start of each encounter, all participants roll for initiative. The initiative roll is 1d20 plus the character's dexterity modifier. All characters are then ranked highest to lowest, with the fastest characters acting first and the slowest acting last. If at the start of combat not all the characters are aware of their enemies, then they are taken by surprise. Surprised characters are skipped over during the first round of combat and may not take reactions such as opportunity attacks until after their first turn in combat. Basically, the character cannot take any actions while surprised, and they stop being surprised as soon as they are skipped over in the first round. After that, they can act as normal, meaning they can take reactions. If a player wishes to act later in the round, then on their turn they can take a ready action. When they do so, they declare a trigger and an action they will take in response to that trigger. They spend their action on their turn for the ready action, and if the triggering condition occurs before the end of that round, they may choose to spend their reaction to respond with the action that they readied. Think of it as a game of baseball. On the batter's turn, she wants to swing her bat at the pitcher's ball. But there's one problem. On her turn in initiative, the pitcher hasn't thrown the ball yet, so there's nothing for her to swing at. Instead, she takes a ready action and declares, If a baseball comes within reach of my bat, I will hit it. Later in the round, the pitcher throws the baseball, which triggers the batter's readied action and allows her to hit the ball into the stands. When it is a player's turn, they can move a number of feet equal to their speed score. This can be broken up with actions taken in between, for example moving, attacking, and moving again, as long as the total distance moved doesn't exceed your speed score. If you have more than one speed score, for example a walking speed and a flying speed, you can freely change modes, but all feet traveling in previous modes count against the speed score of the new mode. So if you have a speed of 30 and a flying speed of 60 and fly 20 feet and land, you can only walk 10 more feet on your turn. Walking over difficult terrain like sand, stairs, or shallow water counts double. You spend 2 feet of movement for every foot that you move. Crawling also costs double, like difficult terrain, but it does stack with difficult terrain so crawling through sand is going to cost you 3 feet of movement for every foot you move. You're penalized 1 extra foot of movement for being difficult terrain and another foot of movement because you're crawling. 
a creature can move through the space of another creature that is at least two size categories bigger or smaller than they are. Creatures can also squeeze through an area that is one size category smaller than they are. Every foot of movement costs double while you are squeezing. Also, squeezing creatures suffer disadvantage to their attacks and grant advantage to those who attack them. Characters can interact with items while they are moving. For example, drawing a sword or opening a door. Doing so usually does not cost an action or any of the character's movement that turn unless the DM rules that what they are doing requires extra time or attention. Also, standing up costs half your speed. If your speed is 30 and you stand up, you can only walk for 15 more feet that round. With that, we'll bring this video to a close. If you found this video helpful, please give us a like, and don't forget to click that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss out on our future videos. Leave us a comment letting us know what topics you'd like to see covered in our future videos, and we can always be reached through our Twitter and Facebook pages too. If you'd like to use some of the maps that we feature in our videos in your own games, you can find them at Maps of Mastery. A link to that store can be found in the description. Thanks for watching, take care, and we'll see you soon with more basics for your favorite tabletop games.